We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship Christ the Lord. Worship him, Jesus Christ the Lord. Let's forget about ourselves, concentrate on him and worship him. Let's forget about ourselves, concentrate on him and worship him. Let's forget about ourselves, concentrate on him and worship Christ the Lord. Worship him. Jesus Christ the Lord. He is all my righteousness. I stand complete in him and worship him. He is all my righteousness. I stand complete in him and worship him. He is all my righteousness. I stand complete in him and worship Christ the Lord. Worship him, Jesus Christ the Lord. Worship him, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Have a blessed Sabbath, everyone. Amen. Amen, sister. I want to, I want to, I want to share a thought with you before we begin. I, I have been looking at this week. I found myself looking at some old proverbs and trying to apply them to. The Christian walk. And one proverb that came to mind was out of sight, out of mind. I'm sure we are we are we are all familiar with that proverb. And what it means is that usually when you are unable to see a person, you're you are not focused on that person. You 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 tend to forget about that person. And in a general sense, this is this is often true. <laughs> And the, the, the challenge, the challenge of Christianity is to overcome this principle because one of the most in, in important instructions that Jesus ever gave was abide in me. In other words, he's asking us not to forget about him and to focus on somebody that we cannot see. Something that is not really easy for humans to do. But this is where the fight of faith comes in. And what I want to suggest to us this morning is that we have to find ways as human beings to make this possible, to make it happen. That's why it's a fight. To focus on somebody that you cannot see. But there are practical and creative ways creative. in which we can do this. And I find that I've been trying to come up with little ways myself, which I find helpful. You know, for example, this week, as I was reading my Bible, I said, Lord, please sit beside me and help me to understand this passage. Now, it might sound simplistic and childish, but it worked. Because what it did is, is helped me to have a mental image of Jesus sitting beside me, helping me. And in our limited human minds, things like these are important when i sat down here this morning to speak i said lord please sit beside me and help me and this kind of approach 
helps us not only to include him in everything that we're doing, but as I said, it reconditions us mentally. And I'm suggesting that we, we, we come up with things like these in everything that we're doing for our own good and for our own mental reconstruction to find ways to remind ourselves that even though we cannot see him, he's always there and always waiting to be involved in everything that we're doing. So that is my encouragement to all of us as we continue in our sojourn and in our relationship with him. I'm going to ask you to just bow your heads with me as we invite the Lord's presence. Father, I want to thank you on behalf of us, on behalf of all of us, for the opportunity to, 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 to fellowship together this morning and to share on another beautiful Sabbath day. I ask that you would bless everything that is said and done here today and that at the end of the day, we will all be drawn that much closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, now, my, mommy won't, my mother won't be happy with me saying this because she says that we are always saying we're not well. And I've done that for three weeks in a row now. But I'm getting there, I'm getting there. I'm still having a little tightness in my chest and a little difficulty breathing. I find that I get tired very quickly. But I'm better than I was last week. So slowly, I, I, as I said last week, I'm sure this has to be COVID. But I'm recovering. Now the topic of my presentation this morning is how to die happily. How to die happily. It might seem like an unusual topic, but I'm sure you can already infer some of the things I want to say. So the Bible teaches us that in the last days, there are going to basically be three categories of Christians on the earth. Three categories. Well, in the context of what I want to say, three categories of Christians. Now, the first category is those who go to sleep before the Lord returns. And when I say go to sleep, I mean through natural causes. Now, in our fellowship, we have seen, I would say, a rapid escalation of, of, of that in the last few years. There are so many people that I grew up with and, and, and fellowship with, and they have, they, have, they have gone to sleep. I, 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 tomorrow's sister Tracy has to put her sister to rest, and I know how close they were. In a, in a couple of weeks, Brother Lloyd will have to put his wife to rest. And I can, I, when I was counting up how many of our brethren have gone to sleep, I think I got up close to 15 in just a short period of time. I know people always die, but, but there, there's definitely an escalation in recent times. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a very difficult thing to deal with, very difficult thing to deal with, because you know that you're not going to see that person in this life. Again, it's not a, it's, it's not a long time, but we're not going to see them in this life again. And the Bible told us, that this would be one category of people, as I said. But you know, God says some things about those who rest. In Psalm 116 and verse 14, we are told that precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. What God is trying to say to us here is that every one of his children who goes to rest, it's, it's important to him. In fact, the Amplified Version says, important and significant in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. It's not something that where God says, well, every day people die, so it's no big deal. Every one of them that goes to sleep, he makes a note of it. It's important to him and it matters to him. And, you know, I believe that, well, there may be more of us who go to sleep. I may be one, I don't know. but. The Bible says that it says something interesting. It gives a reason that I find encouraging. In Isaiah, we have, we have looked at this verse many times recently, but I'll quote it again. Isaiah 57 and verse 1. 
it says that the righteous perisheth and no man laid it to heart and merciful men are taken away none considering that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come what god is saying here is that one of the reasons why his children go to sleep is that he's removing them from the evil that is to come i suppose this could be applied in every age of the world the world has always been an evil place but i'm suggesting to you that more than ever it is applicable now because the evil days that are to come upon the world are going to be unprecedented many times i try to think about the time of trouble and what it is going to be like and you know i have a lot of ideas in my head but you really can't come up with something tangible and something clear because none of us have ever has ever seen anything like it before and you know i used to watch the, the, the closest i can come to the closest I can, the closest thing i can come to i used to watch movies as a child growing up about these the, a zombie apocalypse and a zombie apocalypse is when these mindless creatures take over the world and they are their only intention is to destroy and to kill those few sane ones who are left and those people have to be running for their lives and hiding and doing whatever it takes to survive so i'm not so I'm, I'm not in any way suggesting that there's going to be a zombie apocalypse but i'm saying that the concept that i have in my mind is similar because there's going to be an apocalypse of evil it's going to be a situation where the hearts of men become more wicked than even the days of noah where every imagination of the thoughts of men was only evil continually and they are going to be mindless slaves of evil because there will no longer be any holy spirit to hold back the natural impulses of men so the world is going to become a place where the minions of evil who have all the resources and all the money and all the power of the world are going to channel all of those things for the to the to, to the sole purpose of defying god and destroying his people so evil days are ahead very evil and the bible says one of the reasons why god's children sleep is that he is allowing them to be taken away from the evil that is to come our brethren who are sleeping they don't have to worry about that they are part that they, 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 they have taken a shortcut to glory as i like to phrase it and you know i ask myself the question why does God decide? All right, Sister Gloria is going to be taken away from, from the evil. Sister Marsha is going to be taken away. Why does God decide this one is going to be taken and this one is going to stay? And the answer to that is, I don't know. But he knows. What we have to do is to trust that he knows best in every situation. And everything that he does is for the very best. So I might look at it and I might say, this person is so young. This person was not ready to die. This person is gone too soon. But this is never the case when we're talking about a child of God. Because every single thing that he does, as long as that person belongs to him, it is the best thing in that situation. And I believe that. This is definitely one of the reasons why we are seeing so, much, so many of our brethren being put to sleep. But you know what Jesus says about them in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 30, first section of those who go to sleep. Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, said the Spirit, that they may rest from their labor. In the eyes of Jesus, the death of his saints is precious. But every one of them who sleeps, he says, you are blessed. Why? Because you are, you, you, you are now resting from your labors. The evil days that are to come upon this world, you don't have to go through those. You pass through and you are now sleeping. And what is more, the good works that you did, and I'm going to tell you that he's not talking about works. He's talking about one work. And that is the work of choosing him. The record of that work 
is kept in heaven and because of that record their salvation is guaranteed it doesn't matter how perfect they were how flawed they were the record of that choice is all that he needed and that choice guarantees their salvation one of the things that one of the things that encourages me as i think about our brethren who are sleeping you know every one of them that i can think of they made the choice to choose him and that work follows them and all of them are guaranteed that crown of life because of that choice so they are blessed they are taken away from the evil that is to come and they are resting from their labors and we have to trust him that he knows best so that is one category of christian in the last days now a second category is those that we have been focusing on and talking about a lot these days and i'm speaking about of course those who are translated to heaven without seeing death we understand that this is the one for and the bible tells us clearly that these people will go through the evil days and they will survive them in revelation chapter 7 and verse 13 we we, we know the verses but i'll quote them anyway and one of the elders answered saying unto me what are these which are arrayed in white robes and whence came they and i said unto him sir thou knowest and he said to me these are they which came out of the great tribulation in other words these are the ones who have survived and passed through the great tribulation and they have washed their robes and made them white so the second category of people are going to survive the evil days revelation verse 3 and 10 jesus says because you have kept the word of my patience i will keep you the, 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 the proper interpretation is during the hour of temptation which is to come upon the world so again we see here clear evidence that there's going to be a group of people who pass through the evil days and face now when i say they pass through of course it's not going to be as easy as that these people are going to face death bareheaded many times they are going to be put before firing squads they are going to be maybe they are going to be thrown into fire furnaces and lions dens death is going to stare them in the face many times and each time according to the bible they are going to be rescued from these impossible situations they are going to be the ones who are untouchable i believe that psalm 91 is a passage that is written exclusively maybe i shouldn't use the word exclusively but mainly for this last generation and of this set of people psalm 91 says a thousand shall fall at their side and ten thousand at their right hand but it will not come near them it says they should be afraid of the arrow that flies day and the terror by night or of the pestilence that walks at noon day so in other words it doesn't matter what new pandemic crisis comes up in the world the pandemic no pandemic is going to be able to touch them it doesn't matter what new technology of weapons are invented by the mastermind scientists of the age. It doesn't matter how they include AI technology into it. It doesn't matter how much scientific ingenuity is put into these things. None of them is going to be successful against this last people. And I can envision that God is going to miraculously save them from impossible situations. So I'm not saying they are not going to face death. They are going to face death. But they are not going to be taken by death. And this, of course, is the group of people that will vindicate the kingdom. But there's a third set of christians that maybe we don't focus on as much and we don't talk about as much and i want to spend a little time looking at them this morning and that is the group of christians who are not going to die naturally 
who are not going to die at all. It's the group who are going to be killed to be martyred. I don't know how many times we think about the fact that this is going to happen according to what the Bible says. The beast, which we believe to be the EU, and the image of the beast, which we believe to be the United States, according to the Bible, they are going to actually kill people who refuse to accept the mark, whatever it is when it comes out. They are going to kill people. And we can see this in Revelation chapter 13 and chapter 20. In Revelation 13 and verse 15 it says, And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So the intention of the, the, the powers of the world in the last days is going to be to kill those who refuse to comply. And according to the Bible, in, 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 in chapter 20, we, we, we see that they, they, they succeed in killing some. It says in, in, in verse 4 of chapter 20, I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So here we see clear evidence. What the Bible is telling us is that there are going to be people who suffer a martyr's death. You would have thought that that was an old time primitive thing, but not so. There are going to be people who are killed when they refuse to accept the mark of the beast. This chair keeps slipping. Let me just stabilize it. Now, the Tata is not a pleasant thing, even for Christians. The truth of the matter is that nobody really wants to die. That can be a frightening and scary prospect. Worse, if that death is a violent, painful experience. If I were to do a survey and ask uh, here, I'm sure 99.9% .9 of you would, would say, well, I would like to lie in my bed with no pain, no distress, with my loved ones gathered around me and have the opportunity to say what I want to say to each one of them. And then I close my eyes and go to sleep without pain or distress and just not wake up. I'm sure most people would, would say something along that line. Nobody would say, well, I want to be roasted on a spit like a pig. I want to be beheaded. I want to stand before a, a firing squad and be shot dozens of times. That's what I'm looking forward to. Nobody would say that in the, not nobody in their right minds who is not suicidal anyway. Because death, under normal circumstances, for a normal person, is a traumatic, scary thing. In fact, let me just look at a few examples here of how a normal person reacts to death. You know, I, I know there are people who the doctor says to them, you have three weeks to live. And that is one category of people. They go and they are very traumatized. But I'm speaking here more specifically about those who are executed, those who are killed. Now, here's what the experts say. And I agree with that. What circumstances is a very traumatic and terrifying experience. Usually, individuals display desperation pleading, begging, or attempting to escape. Break down. Individuals may exhibit physical trauma symptoms, including tremors, shaking, sweating, palpitations, and increased heart rate, nausea, vomiting, or dry heaving, Loss of bowel control, loss of urinary control, weakness, fainting. Many people collapse 
or experienced seizures. So I'm going to ask your, I'm going to ask, I'm going to apologize to you for being so graphic, but I am trying to make a point and I'm, I'm sure you will see the point as I go along. I see Brother Ken saying that I'm breaking up. Is that still the case? Are you hearing me clearly now? All right, good. You're going in and out, Brother Daniel. Sometimes you're breaking up too. Uh, I apologize for that. I think the internet connection here is probably the issue. So I'm uh, hopefully it will straighten out. I yeah, mean, it's intermittent. All right, I apologize for that. All right, so from what I just read, you can realize that, in fact, even if I didn't read it, you all know, death can be a very, very disturbing execution, a very disturbing experience. I've heard stories of, of, of grown men, seasoned criminals who are about to face execution and, the, and the, 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 the way they behave. I mean, it just goes to highlight the point I'm making. I heard of this, this, this serial killer who was to be put before a firing squad. And when they brought him and, and put him to stand before the firing squad and he saw all of the weapons aimed at him, his legs became so weak that he collapsed. And every time they stood him up, he collapsed again. It was several days they kept carrying him out before they were able to execute him. He could not stand. I heard of another one who, when his jailers came for him, on the day of his execution, he grabbed on a, 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 a hard murderer. For years, they had been trying to catch him. He had, he had killed over 20 people. And when they came to take him out for his execution, he hung on to the leg of one of his. I think somebody's unmuted. He hung on to the leg of one of his jailers relentlessly and refused to let go. He was so terrified and he was crying and weeping like a child, begging for his life. Another one. This one, I think, was on death row for 20 years. And in the days leading up to his execution, he refused to eat, couldn't sleep. He kept crying uncontrollably. And on the morning of the execution, while as the jailers were opening the door, he just stood looking at them with a terrified, fearful look on his face, and he collapsed right on the spot where he was and died of a massive heart attack before they could take him out for his execution. And as I said, I'm sorry to be so graphic, but I'm trying to make a point, right? That execution can be a terrifying thing, even for the most hardened, seasoned criminal. And we have seen examples of this over and over throughout history. This, this, this man named Victor Figure. A noted rapist and murderer. They said that he wept and begged for mercy when he was about to kill, saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm so scared, as he was led to the gallows. John Evans, in 1983, screamed and cried and sobbed pitifully as he was strapped to the electric chair, saying, I don't want to die, I don't want to die. And the last one, this one named Ricky Ray Rector, another murderer. He wept and begged for mercy, saying, I don't want to die. Please don't make me die. So the point I'm trying to make is that the, 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 the normal reaction to execution is fear and dread and terror. Now, I'm, I'm suggesting to you that it is a natural reaction. Because God put something in every one of us called the, the, the instinct of self-preservation. It, 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 it is inside every human being. And in fact, it is inside every animal as well. And what this instinct does, whenever your life is at stake, I mean, living, living creatures will do almost anything to preserve that life. They will bargain their house. They will bargain their, their car. Some of them will bargain their very mothers to save their own skins. And because of this instinct, 
it is almost impossible for a normal in fact it is impossible for a normal human being who is sane and not suicidal to die willingly i saw a, a documentary on national geographic once where this fox was caught in a trap and he, he, he was there struggling and struggling for hours to escape and he couldn't and then in the evening he heard the hunters and the foxes in, at, at, coming from a distance and he knew that this was do, a do or die situation you know what the fox did he chewed off his own leg chewed it off and left the piece that was caught in the trap and ran off with three legs right he 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 he, he gambled and realized that it was better to live with three legs than to lose his life the instinct of self-preservation exists even in flies and mosquitoes so dying under normal circumstances is something that is very difficult and traumatic that's the point i'm trying to make but and here is the thing that i want to emphasize it's ever since the dawn of time ever since god has had people on this earth there have always been attempts and successful attempts to kill them anytime god has sent a message no matter how small the message is satan's immediate and automatic response has always been to try to kill the messenger that's always been the case and this is why in the end his his his, his battle he, he, he will embark on an all-out war to kill the two witnesses to kill the one for the four thousand to eradicate the three angels message it has always been the case i suppose i could say that maybe abel was the first martyr and in fact i'm gonna go death and martyrdom and violent death has always been part and parcel of the existence of god's people it's a very strong statement but it's true violent death has always been a part and parcel of the experience of god's people if you go to hebrews chapter 11 which is which is generally regarded as the hall of faith you will see that it outlines some mighty men of the old testament champions of the faith heroes of god and it outlines some of the things that they accomplished and achieved but you know what it also says look at what hebrews chapter 11 and verses 39 35 to 39 says of god's people it says women received their dead raised to life again and others were tortured not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection others had trials of cruel mockings and scourgings yea moreover of bonds and imprisonment they were stoned they were sawn asunder they were tempted were slain with the sword they wandered about in sheep skins and goat skins being destitute afflicted tormented of whom the world was not worthy they wandered in the deserts in the mountains in the dens and in the caves of the earth and these all having obtained a good report through faith received not the promise yes they are mighty men yes they are champions and heroes of faith but part and parcel of their experience was violent death was martyrdom was cruelty and torture and mistreatment so despite the fact that death is such a terrifying thing execution it is also true that god's people always have and always will while this world exists face the prospect of this kind of death now if you think about that from a human perspective without understanding it can be a terrifying thing it can be something that is frightening in fact i used to sit as a child and, and hope and pray that i don't die a martyr's death i wanted it i wanted to be a, a part of the 144,000 so that i don't die or i wanted to die of old age before that thinking of it from a human perspective this would be our approach but, but but there's something i want to 
highlight. It's something we are aware of, but I want to dig a little deeper into it and highlight it. And I want to show you that the death of a Christian is not a normal thing. Now, as I just pointed out to you, there were many people in the Old Testament who were martyred. I want to look at two of them. And the first one is Isaiah. Now, the Bible does not tell us how Isaiah died. Right, but traditionally it is believed that he was he was put inside a log and sawn into he was cut into with a wooden saw that's what is believed traditionally now i'm going to quote from it's i, I believe I, I was reading something from either the talmud or the apocrypha right now i know that none of those are inspired writings but in sometimes in these writings you might find little tidbits of information that have some truth to them and when I, read, when I read about the execution of Isaiah, I, 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 if I let put it this way, if I, if I discover that what was said is, was true, I would not be surprised. And I'm going to tell you why. According to this passage, Isaiah was executed at the command of King Manasseh. Manasseh was one of Israel's most evil kings, and he was Israel's longest reigning king. But the text says that he ordered that Isaiah be put inside a hollow tree stump and that they should cut him in two while he was inside. According to the, 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 the account, when they started to cut Isaiah in two, something happened to Isaiah. He, 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 he was caught up in a vision of heaven. Now, if you remember, Isaiah started his ministry. By, by receiving a vision of heaven and of God. They said that he was caught up in a vision of heaven and a beautiful glow appeared on his face. A smile appeared on his face. His eyes were opened wide with amazement as if he was transfixed on something that the others could not see. And while they were cutting him in two, he did not utter one cry, not a word of protest, showed no signs of pain but seemed to be caught away in inexpressible joy. But as I said, it is not found in the Bible, so I'm not going to teach that as a doctrine or as fact. But personally, I believe it. And as I said, I'm going to tell you why. Or, or I believe it, it, it's possible. Now, the other person I want to touch on is, 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 is the, the man Jesus spoke of who he said was slain between the porch and the altar, a prophet named Zachariah. According to the same document, the prophet Zechariah was stoned. He came to bring a message to the Jews in the temple, and they stoned him between the porch and the altar. The account says that while Zechariah was being stoned, he knelt on his knees singing hymns and prayed. The last thing he did was to pray for the people who were killing him and to pray for the nation of Israel. Now, as I said, this could or could not be true. But if I found out that it's true, I would not be surprised. And here's the reason. The reason is because this account is very much like many other accounts which follow it of how Christians behave and react when they are being martyred. If you jump over to the New Testament, we look at the death of Stephen. Right? The only, the only death that the Bible tells us about as it relates to the apostles is Stephen's death. And I, I believe that it's probably, probably because Stephen was the first one. The Bible records it. But if you look at the way Stephen died, I mean, a man is being stoned to death. And his main concern is that the people around him be forgiven. Stephen says, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Right? The same thing that Jesus said of his, of his, of, of his, his executioners. And what is more, what I find more amazing and fascinating is that while Stephen is experiencing this agonizing and horrific death, he's not crying and begging for mercy. He's not pleading for his life. He's not trying to bargain with his executioners to live. You know what is happening? He seems to be completely oblivious to what is happening around him, not, not even aware of that he's feeling pain, not aware that he's being killed. You know what he says? I see heaven open and the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of the Father. 
he's caught away in a vision. The Lord does something for him in that moment that is supernatural. And Stephen dies happy. Amazing. If you, as I said, the death of the other, the other apostles are not recorded in scripture. But historically, we have an idea of how they died. You know, it is said that Peter was crucified. But he wasn't crucified the normal way. He was crucified upside down at his request. It is said that when they were about to kill Peter, Peter said, listen, I'm not fit to die the same way that my master died. Crucify me upside down. It's agonizing enough to be crucified the normal way. A man requests that you do it and make it more excruciating and painful. That is not normal. That is not normal. The other apostles, it says that Andrew was crucified on an X-shaped cross in Greece. Uh, James, the brother of John, was beheaded by Herod. Thomas was stabbed with a spear in India. Philip was hung in Turkey. Bartholomew was flayed to death by knives. For those who don't know what flaying is, it's when you, they, they remove the person's skin while the person is still alive with knives. Matthew was stabbed with a spear and beheaded in Ethiopia. James, James, the son of Alphaeus, was clubbed to death. Thaddeus was martyred with arrows. Simon the Zealot was crucified. And Matthias, who replaced Judas, was stoned and then beheaded. All of them died violently, painfully, cruelly. And as I said, the Bible does not give an account of their deaths. But you know what? I'm going to say something, and I'm going to go out on a limb and say this. And I'm sure you will agree with me that every last one of them died the same way that Stephen did. Not crying and begging for mercy, not terrified and afraid, not pleading for their lives, but happy, conquering, triumphant, victorious. In fact, if you look at what happened with Peter, it seemed that Peter was eager to die. It was something he looked forward to and embraced. And I'm saying to you, this is not normal. If you compare it with what happens normally when a person is being executed, this was not normal. Something was happening with these people that was not of this world. And this kind of insanity, let me phrase it that way, this kind of insanity did not end with the apostles. I went to Fox's Book of Martyrs, as I saw Brother, Brother Andrew quote not too long ago. And, you know, there are some amazing things in that book. But I'll just highlight a few of them. Of people, Christians sentenced to die in the most horrific ways. And the response to this. Here's one that, that was called... Polycarp of Smyrna. It says that when Polycarp was going to be burned at the stake, he faced his death with calm and courage, praying and singing hymns as he was being burned at the stake and smiling with his executioners. They must have thought he was mad. I always, I always thought to myself that if there was one way I didn't want to die if I was living back then, was being burned at the stake. I mean, I, 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 just, I just imagine being burnt with a little flame on my finger and the, the excruciating pain that that causes. And, and for your whole body to be roasted while you're alive, it's an, it's, it's an extraordinarily terrifying prospect. This man was smiling and singing hymns as he was being roasted on a spit like a hog. I'm sorry to be so graphic. Not normal. This one named Ignatius of Antioch, it says what he was, he, was, he was sentenced to be executed in Rome. And he wrote in his letter to the Romans that he was eager to die for Christ, saying, Allow me to be eaten by the beasts through whom I can attain to Christ. I long to die for him, and I await the beasts that will bring me to life. What this one was saying is that hurry up and kill me so that I can get to him quicker. Amazing. Insanity. Now this one, 
This is one that I found to be amazing. It says, historical accounts describe how Christian martyrs, including women and children, were thrown to the wild beasts in the Colosseum, singing and praising God as they faced their deaths. I really had to sit and contemplate this when I read it. I mean, we know that women and children are the weaker vessel. Men are supposed to be strong and macho and courageous, you know, and, and when a man dies courageously, it is more understandable and acceptable. He doesn't want to seem weak. But women, I've seen women who are scared of little, little dogs, terrified of mice. My, my mother is absolutely mortified of lizards. If you, if you visit our house, you will find all the windows taped up and, and, and any little any little opening that might possibly allow the entrance of a lizard. It's sealed, totally terrified. My wife is mortified of snakes. And when I say snakes, I'm not talking about the big poisonous snakes, the little garden snakes wandering around harmlessly, terrified. And, you know, we understand that women are, as I said, supposed to be this way. Children are supposed to be this way. I took my son to the zoo, and when he, he was walking around, enjoying everything, totally relaxed. And when, he, when we came to the lion's cage, I was holding his hand. I felt every muscle in his body tense, tense up. And he jumped on me. I mean, I had to lift him and hold him, and he was just there shaking. He was saying, I don't like it. I, I want to move. I want to go. The lions were caged, but he was terrified. So it is a normal thing for people to be terrified, but more so women and children. You know what this account says? It says that women and children were thrown in the Colosseum to wild animals, lions, bears, tigers, terrifying creatures. And what did they do? They were singing hymns, children, women. I mean, how do you explain that? Do you think that it is possible for a parent to give a child any kind of pep talk? Any kind of psychological reconditioning that could allow that child to react like that? To see a lion coming towards you and you are singing hymns? I mean, barring absolute insanity, what else can be ex given to account or to explain such a phenomenon? Children, when grown men facing death, whimper and moan and cry, children singing hymns and rejoicing and celebration celebrating i mean what was this i'm hurrying along because the time is almost gone we all know about huss and jero i mean john huss when huss was given the, the, the opportunity the opportunity to recant he refused and then he refused. He was taken to the cathedral, stripped, and led to the courtyard. They tied him to the stake and they gave him one last chance to renounce his beliefs. This is what Huss said. Lord Jesus, it is for thee that I patiently endure this cruel death. I pray thee to have mercy on my enemies. His colleague, Jerome of Prague, as he was being led to his execution, was singing hymns and smelling the flowers. His last words as his fire was about to be lit were, come closer and kindle it so I can see, because if I was afraid of it, I would not have come to this place. And as the fire was lit, he sang another hymn before the flames overpowered him. And the last words he was heard to say were, this soul in flame, I offer Christ to thee. Magnificent, inspiring, insane. Something was different about a Christian dying. That is not normal. Something was different. And when I read these stories, it makes me want to look more deeply into what was the reason behind this. I know, you know, I asked myself the question, why did God allow his people to die like this? viciously, violently, not just the men, but the women and the children, when he had the power to deliver them like he delivered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when he could have easily stepped in and saved his people. Why? Why allow animals to rip them to pieces? Why allow them to be burned at the stake? 
to die the most awful deaths. And you know what I realized? In the same way that God gave miracles and signs and wonders and the gift of tongues and these gifts as a sign to unbelievers, you know what I realized? Martyrdom is also a sign to unbelievers. Martyrdom, it, it is one of the signs that God uses. And what do I mean? When a man is raised from the dead or a blind man is given sight, unbelievers look and they see the amazing thing that has happened and they realize that this is not normal. This is not of humanity. Martyrdom is the same thing. Under normal circumstances, when a man is about to die, and he is distressed and terrified and pleading and bargaining and begging for his life. This is what the world expects to see. It's the normal reaction. You know what it sees instead? People smiling, happy, ecstatic, courageous beyond belief. Children, women. And they are standing there and they are watching and they are not able to understand what they are seeing. I mean, the Romans used to be a particularly cruel set of people who enjoyed watching violence. They used to come to the Colosseum to watch these things. And one of the things that got them going was to see the terror of the people. They used to throw runaway slaves and other, other, other people to wild animals and the terror and the fear that they saw displayed was what got the crowd going but when they came to watch these christians being killed they just could not get the same kick because these people instead of this reaction were happy eager to die fearless and you know what it did it made a great impression on the minds of many of them they were determined now to find out what is it that these people have that makes them like this. And they went and they searched and many of them became Christians. So martyrdom was one of God's greatest tools to witness to unbelievers. And because of the way that Christians died, it won many converts. That is why Tertullus, a second century Christian, he said that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. In other words, the death of Christians leads to the spread of the faith because the way that they die is something that is so astounding to unbelievers that they come and they search and they find Christ. So precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints, but he allows them to die because it will win souls for the kingdom. But you know what I love about our Lord? He's not just thinking about his kingdom, about his glory and his honor. He's thinking about his children, most of all. And he does not leave them to die and to perish by themselves. Let me show you what I mean. I, I'm going to be a little over the time, but I know that he won't mind. Let me show you what I mean. How is it, how is it that Christians were able to face death and die in this otherworldly way? I heard a pastor preaching on YouTube and I listened to him and his, his theory was that the reason why the Christians were able to die like this is because they were obedient and they were following Jesus' instructions. And Jesus says in Luke chapter 10 and verse 28 that you should not fear them which kill the body but are able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So he said, he said the martyrs remembered these words of Jesus and they were being obedient when Jesus said, don't be afraid. So they were able to muster the courage to face death because of what Jesus said. Trust traditional Christians to make it about us and our own work. I'm suggesting to you that it has nothing to do with that at all. And Jesus established a principle which definitely, I'm going to say definitely, explains how Christians were able to die like this and how they will be able to die like this again. 
Look at what Jesus says in Mark chapter 13 and verse 1. Verse 11. He says, when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what you shall speak, neither do ye premeditate, but whatsoever shall be given you in that hour. And that phrase is very important. In that hour, speak ye. For it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost. What Jesus is saying here is that you are going to be brought before people who are much smarter than you, much more educated than you, much more prominent and notable than you. And when you are brought before these people, don't worry about what you are going to say. Because when you come in their presence, not, not the day before, not even the hour before, but in the hour, in the moment that you are brought into their presence, he promises that he's going to do something supernatural. He's going to take control of your intellect, your faculties, your body. And what is going to come out of you is not going to be of you. He says it is the Holy Ghost who is going to speak. Things are going to come out of your mouth that you have never heard in your life. And in fact, I, I am going to read the same account in Luke 21 and verse 12 to 15 because I like the way it is phrased here. He says, but for all these... They shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. I think somebody's unmuted. And it shall turn to you for a testimony. The Amplified Version says this will be an opportunity for you to testify. Settle it therefore in your hearts not to meditate before what you shall answer. Why? I love this verse. It says, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. So if you look at the principle that Jesus is establishing here, what he's saying is that when a Christian is brought to a place where he does not have the capacity of himself to handle that situation, he does not have the knowledge or the education, he says, don't worry yourself. In that moment, I am going to do something for you that is supernatural and otherworldly. I am going to come and take charge and control of you. And what is going to come out of your mouth is going to baffle and astound and bamboozle your enemies. They are not going to have anything to say because it is not you who speak words, but the Spirit himself. I want you to take that same principle. And I want you to put the, the, the experience of execution and martyrdom in that same context. And what is Jesus saying? You know what he's saying? He says, when they lead you up and deliver you to be executed, don't worry beforehand what you will do or how you will behave or how you will handle the situation. As a foolish young man, I used to think that what, you, what needs to happen is that I need to build up courage each year. And build up courage each year until when the time comes for martyrdom, if it comes, I have enough courage to face the situation. A foolish concept. Jesus says, don't premeditate. But you will be given in that hour something that is above and beyond you, above and beyond this world. I am going to do something for you that you don't need to worry about. And the world is going to see it. Your enemies are going to see it. And they will not be able to explain it or understand it. I am suggesting to you that at the moment when you need it, he will give it. He does something for each and every one of his saints who is about to be killed. He comes down upon them in a special way and fills them in a special way. And, 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 and in that moment, you know what? That means nothing to them. They have courage that no human being can have. They have joy and peace that no human being can explain because it is not of them. It is not of them. It is something that he gives at the time when it is needed. I was discussing this verse with Daddy this week. Where God says in Deuteronomy chapter 33 and verse 25, he says, as thy days, so shall thy strength be. In other words, what you need at the time and on the spot, that is what I will provide to you. 
I may not have the courage of a martyr today. I may be terrified when I think of death today. I may be scared out of my wits when I think of standing before 10 guns pointing at me. But I don't need to have a martyr's courage right now because I'm not dying a martyr's death right now. You know what Jesus promises? He says, if you are to face that, don't worry about what will happen when the time comes. Don't premeditate how to behave, how to act, how you will face it. Will you cry? Will you faint? In that hour and at that moment when you need it, he promises, I will come upon you in a special way. I will be there with you, my child. When you walk through the waters, I will be with you. And I will give you something that is above and beyond you so that you'll be able to die more mightily than any hero or champion that this world has ever seen. And when they see it, you will win souls for the kingdom. When they see it, they will not be able to explain it, to gain say it, to speak against it. Souls will be one for the kingdom. But the important thing is that he is the one who takes charge of you at that moment. He is the one who takes charge of your body. So the pain doesn't matter. The circumstances and the situation doesn't matter. All you are experiencing is joy, happiness, eagerness to see him. I mean, it is something that it's wonderful and it's astounding to think about. A Christian will never die alone. A Christian will never die without him. There's only one person who died alone. And none of us can ever go through what he went through. But when the time comes and when the time is right, he will tell you the words to say. He will give you the reaction. He will give you the courage of a martyr. And the world will see it and be shocked and astounded. Now, I didn't finish what I have to say, but I think I've made my point and I won't prolong it anymore. I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters, that whether you are one of those who sleeps before he comes, whether you are one of those who goes through the great tribulation, or whether you are one of those who faces martyrdom for him, you know what? The outcome at the end of all three scenarios is him. All three scenarios, as long as you are with him and you are for him and you have a relationship with him, in all three scenarios, you are safe. I am safe. So I don't need to worry about which one he has in store for me. Because at the end of the road, when I turn my eyes and look to the skies, I will see him as he is. And know, and know that it is nothing but joy that lies in store. So hold fast to him. That is our only job. And it is all he asks us to do. God bless you, brothers and sisters. I, I thank you for listening. I'm sorry about the intermittent breaks, but I, I hope that you got the point. I'm going to close the session in prayer. And then if there are any quick questions or comments, I'll, I'll take them after.